Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And you're about to hear one of my Genius Network interviews. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And I hope you find it very useful. If you want to find out more information about some of the interviews and resources that can help you in your business, you can go to www.joepolish.com. And we have a Joe Polish Recommends section with all kinds of resources and vendors and services and products that we recommend that can help you in your business. And also for more useful interviews and a whole list of other people that I've interviewed, you can go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and enjoy the interview. Welcome to another edition of the Joe Polish Superstar Audio Tape Series. On this tape, Joe interviews Joseph Sugarman. The New York Times called him a mail-order maverick. Bottom Line has regarded him as one of the country's greatest copywriters. And Success Magazine called him one of the most successful direct marketing gurus of all time. Joseph Sugarman defied the experts throughout his career and came up with legendary successes that broke many of the marketing rules of his time. For example, Joe was the first person to use an 800 number in full-page direct response mail order advertising. For many years, his full-page ads appeared in the Wall Street Journal, virtually every airline magazine, major newspapers, and millions of his own catalogs selling everything from electronic calculators to laser beam mousetraps. Joe has brought hundreds of innovative products into the spotlight via direct marketing and is widely regarded by direct marketing insiders as one of the most brilliant strategists and copywriters of our time. Joe also pioneered a number of techniques in TV infomercials, including the live man-on-the-street product demonstrations that are a staple of the business today. In addition to being touted as one of the most accomplished direct marketing experts alive, this former CIA agent and book author is also enjoying the spotlight for his most recent monster success as chairman of Blue Blocker Corporation, one of the nation's most successful sunglass companies sold on QVC via infomercials, print ads, catalogs, and at retail stores. Now let's join Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing, as he interviews direct marketing expert Joseph Sugarman on the telephone. Hello, friends and Piranha members. This is Joe Polish. Welcome to a fantastic edition of the Joe Polish Superstar Audio Tape Series. Today, I'm going to interview Mr. Joe Sugarman. I am really looking forward to this interview. This man is a marketing genius. I'd say icon would be the proper terminology for Joe and what he has done. And can you hear me okay, Joe? Yeah, I can hear you fine. You've done an amazing amount of things, which the listeners just got done listening to a little bit of it. And I'm really looking forward to this interview. For the longest time, I've heard so much about you till I finally recently got to meet you in person and you really are brilliant. You've made a ton of money. You've taught a lot of people what you've done and how you did it. And today, the listeners are going to be privileged to hear more of that. So let's go right into the questions. One of the first things I want to ask you is define what marketing means to you. Well, Joe, marketing to me means positioning a product for sale to a consumer, to a customer, to the end user. And as it differentiated from selling, selling is a technique to do that. But marketing is positioning not only the sales pitch, but the product itself. And that may mean changing the product or presenting the product in a different way. So it really involves selling, and it involves a lot of the thought before a product is actually even created. Okay. Is there a difference between selling products or services? There isn't really. The same principles apply, and the best thing to do is to understand very thoroughly what the service is and what motivates your customer to buy the service. Basically, it follows all of the same principles. It doesn't matter. You still have to follow the same principles. Okay, so it doesn't matter if someone sells a widget or they sell a service. There's principles that apply every time. Every time. Okay. The same principles. Excellent. All right. Well, you wrote a great book called Triggers, 30 Sales Tools That You Can Use to Control the Mind of Your Prospect to Motivate, Influence, and Persuade, which is an excellent book, and I highly recommend all the listeners read this book. But I want to talk a little bit about that. How do you use psychological triggers to enhance the sale of a product or a service? Well, the psychological triggers are those psychological techniques that you could use to influence a person to make a positive buying decision. And I can probably give you a few examples of that. For example, one of the triggers is guilt. If you ever get these mailings with return address stickers or the mailings with a dollar bill to fill out a form or in a survey, or maybe you get a mailing with a lot of material in it, 
Well, what the mailer is trying to do, basically, in a direct marketing sense, is to make you feel guilty. So when you receive it, you're not going to just throw out the package. You're going to keep the stickers, and you're going to feel guilty about it, and you're going to send a contribution, or you're going to fill out the questionnaire, and you're going to return it. So guilt is used a lot in direct marketing, and it could be used in a lot of different ways. One good example is Publishers Clearinghouse. When they have those sweepstakes, they found through their testing that when people received a lot of information, the more information they received, the more guilty they felt, the more they kept the materials, the more they responded. And so guilt is a very important factor. There are other psychological triggers that direct marketers use. By the way, the book was designed for selling. It was designed for personal salesmanship. What I found was by using some of these psychological triggers to affect response, I was able to double response in direct marketing. So I said to myself, what would it look like if I took those same psychological triggers and applied them to selling situations? How would I use them? How would they differ? And I came up with the book, Triggers, and it contains 30 of these psychological triggers that cause people to make a positive buying decision. I give another example of a TV salesman. He's one of the most effective TV salesmen in this particular store who would do very little. He'd sit at the entrance to the store, and he'd wait for people to come in, and they'd walk around the store, and the minute he saw them starting to turn the knobs or touching a television set or doing something with a product that was on display, he'd walk up to them immediately and start his sales pitch. What he found was that when somebody walks in and actually starts touching something, there is a 50% chance that he will be able to sell them something. If they just walk in and look, the chances of him selling them are roughly 10%. And so he used this concept. Well, we could use that in direct marketing. In other words, it's called an involvement device. The consumer gets involved with the product, either mentally or visually or in some sort of fashion, and that creates a very positive selling psychological trigger. And I talk about how to do that, and not only how to do it in my book called Triggers, but also in one of my books on writing effective copy. It's interesting, that example that you just gave. I bet if the guy watching people walking into the store before they started touching the televisions, if he immediately got in their face or at least went up to them, there's the possibility that he would interrupt the natural process of letting people just go to the things. Do you think timing was a crucial aspect in that trigger? Oh, of course. There is a time to approach somebody, but the point was that he used that to indicate to him that they were very serious and they were getting involved with the product. And it's that little insight that helped him become quite a successful salesman. And obviously, the more you're aware of what it is that shows signs of people willing to buy or little things that you can use in every aspect of your promotions, the better your chances are of not only making additional sales, but also not wasting a lot of time on unproductive or unqualified people, I would say. Yeah, well, it's used even today. If you ever get these mailings that have a little disc that says yes and no, and pull out the yes disc and put it in the slot, and you look at that and you say, well, that's kind of juvenile, isn't it? But the person that came up with that idea found out that they could actually double response simply by putting in this little involvement device. And there are other involvement devices that could be used in mail order, direct mail, TV even, that cause people to get involved with your product or service. And so bottom line of all of this is that an involvement device is very important because it can double response. And in the case of this TV salesman, it really did increase his response ratios. Yeah, very good. What's an example that you use with an involvement in some of your promotions? Well, there was, a, <laughs> there was an ad. I did a mail order ad for a spelling computer. And I put in a little bit in there that if they circled any misspelled words in my ad, and there were several, they would get $2 off for every misspelled word that they circled and sent in with the ad. I had something like 30 misspelled words. In fact, the word misspelled was misspelled. Really? And I had people call me up, actually, on the phone. They said, you know, I saw your ad in the Wall Street Journal. I normally spend about a half hour looking through the journal. I've spent an hour and a half reading your ad. I just want you to know you've been wasting my time. He wasn't even interested in buying the product, but that was an involvement device. I got people involved in that ad. And, of course, the real lesson there was that if you didn't guess all of the words that were misspelled, you needed this product. Actually, that's brilliant. I know a lot of applications where I could use that on top of the fact that it would help me get my clients involved in helping me edit some of my own copy, too, which is funny. <laughs> that's good. Very good. Now, what are some other ones that you like that are part of the psychological triggers? Are oh, guild and involvement your favorites, or do you even have a favorite? There are so many. I would say that almost every one of them has doubled a response for me at one time or another in my career. And so applying those both from a direct marketing standpoint and from a selling standpoint should do the same. There's one that doubled response for me, for example, in a mail order ad. I had this one offer. It was a 700-word offer, and I ran it testing the response to see which version worked the best. 
And I finally got it to a point where it was really working very well. And then at the very end, I decided to change just a couple words, which I did, and that response doubled. And I looked at it and I said, my, my goodness, what did I do? And I realized what I used was what I call a satisfaction conviction. And it isn't the kind like, if you don't like my product, return it any time within 30 days and you get your money back. That's a trial period. That's not a satisfaction conviction. A satisfaction conviction is really a passionate plea. It's basically saying, look, I'm willing to let you rip me off to prove to you how good my product is, or something similar. The typical reaction that a reader would get after reading a satisfaction conviction would be, wow, there are going to be a lot of people ripping them off, or if this guy isn't truthful, then he's going to be really ripped off. In other words, it's something that will convince people at the very end of your ad that you are so serious about this product and their satisfaction that you're willing to do something that nobody else has ever done before in the history of direct marketing. Of course, <laughs> you've got to come up with something that is unique and is different and does express that passion. But it's called satisfaction conviction, and it is a very powerful tool. What did you actually do in the ad to actually create that, or is that a secret that everyone's going to have to read the book to find out? <laughs> well, I'll be happy to tell you. It was a subscription offer, and the control was if you are not happy with this two-year subscription that we're providing you with, you can cancel any time, and we'll send you back the unused portion of your subscription. And the satisfaction conviction basically said, Hey, look, at, if you're unhappy with this newsletter, any time over a two-year period, you can stop. We'll send you all your money back, plus we'll give you interest in what you've spent for the subscription so far. Wow. And people are going to read that and say, well, I can see somebody getting the subscription for two years and at the very end asking for their money back, and plus they get interest. Boy, these people must really be convinced that this is a really significant newsletter. Yeah, and that throws a whole new twist into the interpretation of that offer, and I think it's great. It's basically, when you look at it from a financial consideration, it's basically that it has the same effect on the marketer as if you just had a trial period, because if they're going to return it, they're going to return it fairly soon, and if they're going to keep it for a long time, I think guilt sets in. I think very few people are going to be dishonest and keep it for two years and just ask for their money back. So from a marketing sense, it doesn't really affect the bottom line, but from a sales sense, boy, does that sound a lot more powerful than just a simple subscription offer. Yes, it does. Do you think there's a difference between guilt and reciprocity? Basically, guilt and reciprocity are very, very close. In fact, very often reciprocity, that's a term that was used by Professor Cialdini in his book, Influence. And in his book, he talked about basically four to five of the psychological triggers that I cover. And one of them was reciprocity. But I think it's more accurate to say, isn't it really guilt? People receive it and they feel guilty. Yes, they want to reciprocate, but it is the feeling of guilt that is the real psychological trigger. Yeah, I agree with you. Oh, you know, I want to bring something up, too, which was something I really wasn't going to talk to you about, but I'm kind of thinking about it now. Using some psychological triggers, a lot of people tend to think that when you make a free offer, knowing that if people are impressed with something, that they're going to buy additional things, or if you, in the case of a charity promotion, if they're going to put labels for return address mailings and things in order to create guilt and reciprocity, that somehow that's sneaky, or that's manipulative, or that's taking advantage in some way. I personally don't think it is. I just think it's smart marketing. However, I hear that a lot from certain people. How do you feel about that? How would you address that type of thing? You know, is it really sneaky? Is this abusing somebody psychologically to use tricks and techniques in order to get them to buy? Oh, not at all. Actually, my second book is called Anti-Triggers, and it's how to understand the triggers so you don't get taken by the people that try to use them. I think one of the things that psychological triggers do, they're effective sales techniques. If you're a salesperson or a direct marketer, you want to use the best sales techniques, the best tools that you can muster. And using psychological techniques, as long as you do them with integrity and honesty, I think is perfectly okay and should be part of a regimen that you use for your tools. I mean, if you look at a mechanic, a good mechanic will go out and buy the best tools. And in essence, that's what these are. Yes, I agree with you totally. And you said it. If you do it with integrity, then that's the ticket to use everything humanly possible in order to get your product or service into the hands of your clients. Now, in your opinion, what is the strongest motivational factor in getting a person to buy from a direct marketer? I think the strongest, believe it or not, is curiosity. It's particularly strong in the case of a book or a publication or a newsletter or something where you can raise a lot of issues. For example, I can talk about the 30 psychological triggers in our interview, and we can talk about five or six of them, but if you want to get the rest of them, you've got to buy the book. And if you're curious enough, you'll buy the book.
and I don't mean to manipulate your audience, but it's a fact. And actually, I'm a salesman. And so in the process of doing this interview, I might say things to you and to your audience that will influence them to buy. So, yeah, it's curiosity, and it could be used in many different formats. For example, if I wanted to sell a product, the person cannot touch and feel that product. The person cannot experience what it's like to own that product until the person receives it and then uses it. Well, with retail, of course, they have instant gratification. You can go over, you can touch, you can feel, you can determine right on the spot whether you like it or not. But if there's enough interest and enough persuasion, a person reading a mail-order ad and reading the curiosity that you develop in your ad, that person must buy the product in order to satisfy the curiosity. So I think that's probably one of the strongest of the psychological triggers as well. Well, you actually did a phenomenal job with it with Blue Blocker sunglasses and the infomercials like you had mentioned. I've either heard this on tape or in person or read it somewhere that you never did an infomercial where you actually put the camera behind the lenses of the sunglasses. So they were always curious to know what is it actually like. Is that true? No, oh, that's absolutely true. As a matter of fact, having people try on a pair and watching their reactions and having these real people and having these as real reactions, and of course some of them not realizing they were being videotaped or not realizing that they were going to be part of a commercial, these reactions were the things that created the curiosity. Had I put the camera behind the lens and satisfied that curiosity, my sales would have been not very good, believe me. And also, the other factor was, when you put a camera behind the lens, you distort the color, which, of course, the blue blockers do. But when you wear a pair of blue blockers, your brain actually adjusts to the color shift. And so you see things in their normal colors, and you don't notice the tint that you would notice uh, behind a camera. So, yeah, it was done purposefully, and it was done because we were trying to maintain as much curiosity as possible. Oh, there you go. I mean, and how many pairs of those glasses have you sold in your career? Oh, uh, we're probably past 20 million now. Jeez, it's a lot of sunglasses. <laughs> oh, there you go. That proves the point. Curiosity does work. Of course, no, I just really want to mention they've received a wonderful product. They received good value. We did it with integrity, but it was, again, a sales technique, a psychological trigger that we used in order to affect a sale. At the time, when blue blockers are probably in their heyday, uh, what year was that? It's hard to say. We've been advertising it from 86 until probably 92, starting in 87 on infomercials and going for six years and then until about 93 and then going into retail and on QVC. So it's been a long time. When I finally looked through a pair of them because I had purchased a pair from you just recently and after I looked, I was totally amazed. I don't know how to explain it, but it's a very pleasant view when you are wearing these things, what the lenses do. That's another thing, too. You brought out a really interesting point. I can't sell something that I personally do not like. I have to be passionate about it. I have to really like it because in my advertising, I reflect my personality. And if my personality doesn't like something, it's going to come through. But if I really like something, if I'm really passionate about it, that also comes through. Well, you know, a question that I was going to ask you, which is how important is it to have an attached emotion or passion for your product in order to write great copy, or is that necessary in order to be able to develop a good promotion? I mean, how important is that? I believe it's crucial, but how important is it for, say, like an expert like you? Could you take something that you don't even really like that much and still create a killer copy for it? Or Let's say that you can take a product that you don't have an emotional attachment to, and you could write great copy and do a great job and be very enthusiastic about it if you feel that the product is a good product. In other words, it's a good direct marketing product. It has a lot of potential. So you can put your own emotional liking and disliking aside and look at it from the point of view, will this make a good product? Is it a good product? Now, let's talk about the emotional attachment. When does that come into play? For example, for years I loved gadgets. And so I had an emotional understanding of why people love gadgets. True, I could have sat down and interviewed a lot of people and did a lot of research and bought gadgets and tried to get a sense of feel for what it's like to be a gadget person. But by having that emotional attachment to gadgets, I knew the emotional triggers that would cause people to buy. I knew what people really looked for because I was that person. I was really selling myself. And so it's a kind of a yes or a no. I could take a product that I have no emotional attachment with. Let's just take pantyhose, for example. If somebody gave me a product that was very unique and that had a very large appeal to women and that could become a very hot product, I would learn everything that I could about this product, and I would create an ad that would reflect everything I knew about it, and I would make it very, very effective because I feel it could be a big seller. See, for me, I have no major interest in golf, for instance. 
But if someone brought a killer golf club to me and they needed a promotional piece created or a strategy created on how to sell it, I could do that. What I wouldn't do, which I think goes right along with what you're first saying, I would never in a million years try to sell anything that I thought was a piece of junk or a piece of crap. I think that's the worst thing that you could ever do. One of the techniques you would use, Joe, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, is you'd take that golf club and you'd take golf in general and you'd become an expert as much as you could on golf. You'd go out to the golf courses, you'd talk to people who played with the golf clubs, you'd probably take some golf lessons. You become literally an expert in a very short period of time as to what makes a really good golf club and what the competition offers. And only then could you sit down and write a really good ad. And Joe, you'd probably write it with great emotion and great conviction because you're basically picking up that emotion and conviction from the people that you've interviewed. Before sitting down and writing copy, what do you personally do to prepare yourself, to put yourself in the right mindset? Well, first of all, I look at the product. I have the distinct luxury of deciding which products I want to sell and which products I don't want to sell. Of course, we all do. But what I'm saying is that I can pick and choose and not have to concern myself with doing it in the sense of providing a service. I'm doing it because I want to sell it myself. Or in some cases, yeah, I'll write copy for somebody, but I rarely charge them and it's for a good cause or something like that. But to prepare myself for writing good copy, I look at the product first. And I, first of all, determine where I could sell this product, how it could be sold, if it could be sold, what markets it could be sold in. Maybe we should start really with that, is how do I select a good product, and then what do I do once I find a good product? Would that be a fair way yes. to go about it? Yeah, how do you find and evaluate a new product for the marketing potential of it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, the first thing I do is if you can visualize a ruler, a 12-inch ruler, and the ideal products are products that would appeal to the mass market, that is everybody, from children on up to people who are retired, that is the ideal product, and that would represent 12 inches on a ruler, okay? Okay. So then let us say I wanted to sell a product that appealed to all men or all women. Well, then I can take that ruler and I can cut it in half, can't I, Joe? Yes, you can. So then I'm only appealing to half of the market. So now I want to offer a product that let's say appeals to women and is something that is about $200. Well, I can take that six inches and reduce it down to two inches or maybe even one inch because price is going to play an important factor. Okay. And so what I do is I take this ruler and I see what limitations I've given myself. You know, this might be for all women and it might be very expensive and it might be a product that has nothing to do with fashion but has maybe something to do with business. And so that reduces that even further. And so you get to a point where you see how far in that ruler you're reducing the interest in your product. So what I look for is a product that has at least the potential of having as big an audience as possible, but particularly at least half the audience. And so if it's a golf product, I'm really not interested in that. If it's a tennis product, that really maybe appeals to 10% of the population, 20% at the most. And so then I have to refine that by virtue of the price point, and it starts to get kind of small. But if I had something like blue blockers, we can use that as an example. Here was a product that appealed to both men and women, boys and girls, adults, I mean, it appealed to an extremely broad market, so I knew that product was really very good. The second thing I look for is margin. If I can have a perceived value that is very, very high, and then I have the margin to work with, then that makes a very good direct response product because I could spend a lot of that margin on advertising, maybe as much as 50% to really establish the name, to create a brand name, to sell the product. And another thing I look for is continuity. And you've heard that word before used, let's say, with vitamins. You subscribe to a particular type of vitamin, and you give them your credit card, and every month you receive your vitamin supply. That's an ideal example of continuity. I've had a vitamin program. It lasted almost 10 years. I stopped advertising after the first two years, and the tail end of that promotion lasted eight years. That is a wonderful example of continuity. But continuity is also possible by providing upsells, that is, you capture a person's name and you sell them other things. Continuity could involve, for example, the case of sunglasses. And we sell blue blockers, but people lose them. People break them. People have to buy them again. And so there's a form of continuity, whether we realize it or not. It's not something that you can exploit. It's not something that's obvious. But continuity is an extremely important element in those type of products. Well, and this tape of the month is continuity. Exactly. All the this listeners right now are involved in a continuity relationship with me. Right, because every month they get this, and every month they look forward to it. They're pleased with the service that you're providing. That's another thing about continuity. The people that buy vitamins on continuity never have to worry about going to their store. The people who get your tape every month know from the quality of the previous tapes, and which I've listened to, by the way, and the reason I'm agreeing to do this is because you do a really good job. 
they like the job you're doing, and they're continuing with this continuity because of the value you provide them. Yes, thank you. Now, the other issues, I look again at the margin and the price point, because if it's a low enough price point and the margin's high enough, then I know I've got a product that appeals to a broad market. The other item would be some sort of protection or patentability. That could be by virtue of a unique name, such as Blue Blocker. Nobody can use Blue Blocker. They can't use Blue Block. They've got to be careful when they use anything that's similar because it's a registered trademark. Also, patentability. If you can protect your product so that others won't go after it, that is very important. Although patentability is really one of the smaller things I look at because it's very difficult to defend a patent, and most patents you can get around. And there's so many people out there that will knock you off and then disappear. So it becomes a very difficult thing. But if it's a patented product and the patents have really good, solid protection, that's very important. Yes, very good. I gave you the example of pantyhose before. Uh, <laughs> I, when I was in electronic gadgets, I never thought for the life of me that I'd ever be in sunglasses, and yet Blue Blocker became the tail that wagged the dog. Uh-huh. So then along comes another product that I'd never in my wildest imagination think that I'd be involved in, and that is somebody came to me with a very unique approach to women's hosiery. And I didn't know this, but a lot of women hated pantyhose. They just did not like to wear them. They were uncomfortable. They were cold in winter and hot in summer and just all sorts of pulling and tugging they had to do. And it was always slipping down. And I just hated it. And this woman invented a pantyhose system that consisted of the hose or the two stockings connected with a very unique mechanism to the panty. And in some initial tests, women absolutely loved this concept. And it's an example also of continuity, because once you buy a pair and you really fall in love with it, you can't buy it anywhere else except from our company. And so there is a level of continuity. Because there's so much of this product sold, we can go to the mills that actually make this product and have this product made for us. And so you get the difference between the manufactured cost and the selling price, and that's a fairly large margin. And, of course, it reaches half the market. And as a matter of fact, it goes beyond half the market because men buy this product for women. So it has an appeal (laughs) for for men as well. I'm sure there's probably men who buy it for themselves too, but I'm saying from a marketing standpoint, it appeals to men and women. And the ad we created, it was a very attention-getting ad because you have to show the product on somebody to explain it, and it would attract a very broad audience, if you excuse the pun. (laughs) <laughs> that is very funny. I bet the research for preparing to do that promotion was pretty interesting. Well, it was funny because I had to interview people. I had to talk to people. I had to get facts. I had to consult with people and discussing panties. I mean, you know, <laughs> it was a very, but a good copywriter, and here's really a good point, a good copywriter can write copy on practically any product. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you do the research and you understand the marketing potential of a product and how to position it. Well, let me tell you one of the problems with that product, because I think it's important for your audience to realize, and that is one of the other powerful psychological triggers is simplicity. And I have run tests, and I talk about them in my book, where I sell something and I make it just slightly more complicated, and the results dramatically drop. Well, one of the big issues with the hosiery product is that it is complicated because you've got to buy a specific color, a specific size, a specific length, and you know all of these things. Well, how do you buy them? And then how do guys buy them for their girlfriends or for their wives or spouses? So it's a really tricky thing. And so my challenge there was coming up with something that was so simple and so easy to order. So if you're a man and you want to order this product for your girlfriend, all you have to know is her height and approximate weight and all the rest we could figure out for you. Or if you're a gal, you know all of these figures and issues, and and you just order what you need. Interesting. How exactly did you do that? Just what I said. We basically said, just give us your height and your weight and the color stocking that you'd like. And uh, And they would arrive perfectly ready. And they would arrive ready to be given as a gift to your loved one. Wow, very good. Cool. Well, you know, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how do you build a story or a concept around a product to make it more marketable, other than research and everything? I mean, do you have any techniques that you would use? or? Any? Well, every product has an inherent excitement, an inherent story, an inherent emotional appeal. Every product has it. It's just the nature of products. And in investigating a product and learning everything you can about a product, very often a story emerges. It could be the story about how it was discovered. It could be the story of how you discovered it. It could be the story of why you thought it was terrible when you first looked at it. All of these techniques I've used. People love stories. Storytelling is one of the psychological triggers as well. 
storytelling is important because when we were young, when we were very small, the way we learned about the outside world was through stories, and it attracts our attention. I know when I give a speech, if I start telling a story, I can see the attention of that audience glued on me as I start telling that story. And if you'll notice, you were at one of my speeches just recently, Joe. Yes. And you'll notice that my entire speech was a story, interspersed with other stories. And so I had their attention. There wasn't anybody in the audience that was going to sleep because I kept their attention through the use of telling of a story. And so I really look for those stories with products. And people are interested in those stories because they help establish the credibility for a product. They help make them understand where it came from. It gets them curious, and they read all the copy. And so storytelling is a great technique. And with a salesman, it's also a great technique. Some of the greatest salesmen I know have great stories. They tell great jokes. People love stories. They love jokes. They love getting involved with the product. It's also a way to get involved. Well, aside from stories, then, what are the key elements, like the most important elements in a mail order ad? Well, the most important is the headline, because if that headline doesn't grab you and cause you to do something, then you've lost the reader. So as that reader is leafing through the pages, that headline has got to be strong. And so typically in my headlines, there are only a couple words, two, three, four words. Rarely do I use a headline that has more words. Why is that? Well, because it is just so easy to read. If you're scanning through something, you might have only a few seconds to attract somebody's attention. Maybe even just one second. And in that one second, if they can read three words and be fascinated enough to want to read the next thing that you put in that ad, you've got them. But if you had an ad, I know Ogilvy, who is one of my idols, by the way, and who I read a great deal about, talked about that every heading should not be greater than 16 words. I find that that works, but it should be in the form of a subheading. In other words, you have a headline that grabs somebody, and then you put in a subheading that defines what that headline really is talking about. And so the second most important thing in the mail order ad is that subheading. And then all the other elements, like the pictures and captions and paragraph headings and everything else in the ad, the layout, your logo, the price, all of these things should get you to do just one thing. And it's really simple, and that's the approach that I use in my copywriting book. And that is to get you to read the first sentence. If all of these elements are designed to get you to read the first sentence, Joe, what is the most important sentence in this ad? The most important sentence would be the first sentence. Right, exactly. And then what do you think the most important next sentence would be? The second sentence. Exactly. Because the key to writing great copy is to get somebody to read the first sentence, motivate them enough to read the second, and then the third, and then the fourth, and then the fifth. Because once they start reading, if you do your job right, you're going to get them to read the whole ad. And it's like walking past a store in a shopping center. If you can get enough people to walk past that store, you're going to get enough traffic in that store. You've got to get enough people to traffic your entire ad. By the way, in the first sentence is so important that we try to make that short. It could be just three or four words. People read that. Oh, it's boy, it's easy to read. So they start reading the second sentence and the third sentence. And it's building curiosity, and they keep reading. By the way, you can go into an ad to four or five paragraphs without telling people what you're selling. You just want them to read. That's the most important thing. If you can get in some of the features of your product, if you can get in some story about your product, if you can get in something about it during those first four or five paragraphs, great. But it isn't important. The important thing is you get them to read. That's the purpose of all those elements in the ad. What is an example of one of your most successful headlines? Because you've had some amazing promotions. Well, for example, we had one for a thermostat. It was, the headline was Magic Baloney. But you read Magic Baloney and you see a picture of a thermostat, you wonder, well, what is it? <laughs> and then you start reading the subheading and it basically says, we looked at this product and it was the most stupid, the most ridiculous product we've ever seen and we wouldn't have any part of it or something along those lines. Uh -huh. Well, you read that subheadline, you've got to read the first sentence in the first couple of paragraphs is just really knocking this product. The name, the case that it had, it looked ugly, the name was stupid, and you knock it. I was knocking this product. I was having a ball. Well, now people they can start reading that and they're saying, now, wait a second, where's the gimmick? <laughs> this guy hated this product. What the hell is he doing? But there is one feature I really liked. And you know what feature that was, Joe? That was the one feature I knew consumers would object to. I knew, so I placed that up front. I knew this was something that they would not like. Okay. Basically, it was installation. You've got to install this product. I said, gee whiz, the one thing I liked about it was the installation. And I explained that the thermostat's connected 24 volts. Nobody's going to get electrocuted. So anybody can take off the thermostat, see the color-coded wires. They all have to be color-coded the same, and put in this thermostat. So anybody can install it. So my biggest problem was installation and fear of the electricity that people might get a shock. Right. And so I covered that right in the very beginning in the first feature that I liked. And then I got into the rest of the features. Then I explained why the ugly-looking case was insignificant, 
why the name was kind of stupid and didn't really matter. Why this product, after discovering the installation, I found to be one of the best products of its kind I've ever seen. And that one approach sold tons of them. As a matter of fact, I got letters from people that said, I read your entire ad. I just want you to know I wasn't in the market for a thermostat. I had very little time to read the magazine that I saw your ad in. And I just want you to know that you took all of my time to read it, that whoever wrote this should be congratulated, or in one case, it was a person that should be fired for taking all my time. But the point is that I got people to read, and I was very honest in my approach, and I disarmed people with the honesty, actually. <laughs> That's great. Magic baloney. That's there, was, there was another ad, I, Miracle Fuzz, was for an ion generator. Miracle <laughs> Fuzz, it doesn't say anything. What does it mean? Sunglass Breakthrough was one of my most successful ads. That was for the blue blockers. And people who are interested in sunglasses will want to find out, what is this breakthrough? And we explained it. Very good. It's giving me lots of ideas right now, just listening to you talk about that. Well, you've had ads that have been phenomenal winners and others that have been big losers. You know, some people in marketing, when they're learning marketing, when they're starting to use direct marketing, they struggle and they become gun-shy about trying certain types of promotions and advertising after they run a loser ad. How do you deal with this challenge after an ad is pretty much unsuccessful because I've got to imagine at your level you've done promotions that have cost you hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars that didn't work. Well, yeah, we've all had those. Well, first of all, let me just say that if you're well prepared and you've really studied direct marketing, you should know by now that not every product is going to be successful, not every promotion is going to be successful. As a matter of fact, if you look at me and you say, well, what about your ratio? I am surprised. I'll venture to say that 80 to 90 percent of the products I pick are going to be winners, but there is 10 percent that I think are also going to be winners that bomb. And so the point I want to make, and this comes after many, many years of experience, when I started, 10 percent of my products were successful. And so what's the difference between the Joe Sugarman of today and the Joe Sugarman of when I started? The only difference is, is I didn't give up. I never gave up. I just kept doing it and doing it. And as I did it, I learned. One of my biggest mistakes was not reading more on direct marketing. And maybe that was a good thing because a lot of people who didn't have the experience and have pontificated as to what should work and what shouldn't work, I might have gotten the wrong information from. But I would have saved myself a lot of agony as a result. But the bottom line was that I learned more from my mistakes. I learned more from my errors. I learned more from direct marketing because direct marketing teaches you to test. And when you test, some of the results totally amaze you. That's one answer to your question. The second answer is, very often the failures cost you a few thousand. If you do your homework right, it shouldn't cost you that much money. But when you do hit, that one hit is so powerful that it dwarfs 20 of your worst examples, worst losses. I can take probably 20 of my worst losses, and that would be dwarfed, literally dwarfed by the success we've had with blue blockers. If I had a loss throughout my entire career and just hit one ad like blue blocker, I'd be sitting pretty. So my point is this, that it's not whether you win or lose. It's whether you're out there playing the game. And if you're playing the game, you're going to learn. You're going to lose, too, but you're going to also win some. And it's the winners that more than make up for the losers. Yeah, I agree. If you're not willing to have a few failures along the way, you pretty much are never going to have any winners because it's par for the course. Somebody once told me it's like a bucket full of oysters, and there's a pearl in one of the oysters. And you're given a bucket, and somebody tells you, open up all these oysters, there'll be a pearl in there. And some people start opening up the first ten and say, geez, I didn't find a pearl in any of these things. I'm getting tired, and they walk away. It's the guy that goes through every oyster, because chances are it's going to be the last one that has the pearl. Let's face it, if you find the pearl, you're going to stop digging in the bucket. You don't need to dig anymore. The point is that there is a pearl out there. If you realize that failure is actually a form of success... It's a success force, I should say. In other words, every time you fail, you get closer and closer to success. So, okay, Joe, what is the biggest mistake that you've ever made in business? Well, we all make mistakes, and I've made my share of them, in fact, quite a few. But I'll never fault myself for trying something that I think would work, that I felt would work, that I had the compassion to make it work, and discover that it didn't. That is not a mistake. My biggest mistake, believe it or not, is probably something that cost me a lot of money, and I didn't even know it. And that was very early in the game in 1973. When in fact, we were the first, I think, to use the toll-free number to take credit card orders over the phone. Believe it or not, prior to that, it was never done. We started taking credit card orders over the phone, and I became kind of smug about my ad layout. I wanted my ads not to look like mail-order ads. I wanted them to look like editorial. And so I had a toll-free number at the end of my ads, and I figured, well, I didn't need a coupon. Well, what would I need a coupon for? 
And so about 10 years later, I had the opportunity to test four different versions of the same ad. I was running an insert in one of the airline magazines, in fact, all the airline magazines, and I decided to make a test. I took one of my ads, and I put just a dotted line around the ordering portion of the ad. And I did some other things, too, but this was the one change that I thought, ah, I'm going to test this. And I discovered that by putting in the dotted lines so that it indicated it as a mail order ad, my response rate was 20% higher all the way across the board. Wow. And I sat down and I thought to myself, for 10, 12, however many years, I have been running my ads and leaving 20% on the table. Amazing. And that was the biggest mistake I've ever made. One, didn't test it early, and number two, there was enough information in enough direct marketing books to indicate that you want to indicate a coupon, that you want to put a dotted line around it, because it basically tells people, this is a mail order ad, this is a product you can order by reading this page and calling a toll-free number, and sometimes this will not be apparent to people, and it makes a 20% difference. Yeah, I got that had to amount in millions of dollars, I imagine. And I would have a headache if I discovered that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the biggest mistake I've made. And who knows, knowing my volumes during those years, that could have amounted to millions and millions of dollars. Again, I can't fault myself on a mistake that I made with good intention, but this was something that I should have, could have, would have, had I known. Yeah, and that's such a simple thing, too. But the lesson to be learned for all the listeners is you constantly pay attention, look at everything, and don't get so proud of what you're doing or think that it's so hot that you can't improve it. Now, one of my excuses for not doing that much testing is because I usually tested an ad, and I was in the electronics and the gadget business when it was really developing. Calculator prices would go down just in a couple months, and so I had to get in a product and out of product, and very often I didn't have the chance to test. But when I went into the airline magazines, I was able to actually create an insert and run four different versions. That's how I knew. That's very good advice. Now, if you had to do all this over again, start all over again, and you only had $1,000 to work with, what would you do to launch a marketing business? If I had $1,000, I'd read everything I could on direct marketing. I'd go out and buy books, or I'd attend maybe a seminar. The reason for it is that's the way to start, because I think the name of the game is to avoid as many mistakes as possible, to avoid the losses. And that's what testing does for you. If I only had $1,000, I had a product, and I could create my own ads, write them up, and actually do an ad, I'd test it, and that's what I would do. I'd go out and I'd test it for the $1,000. But if I had some background, some knowledge to work with to make sure that what I'm writing is correct and to make sure that it's as close to the correct way to do it, I think that would be more valuable than just going out and starting. When I wrote my first ad, I was already somewhat of a copywriter. I was familiar with advertising, I was familiar with printing, I was familiar with all the disciplines that I had to know in order to create that first ad. Now I look back at that first ad and it's just amateurish compared to what I can write now. But back then that was the best I can do and I had experience. And so the idea of somebody getting into this game, unless you have some experience in advertising, marketing and copywriting, I'd become an expert in all those areas. We'll be talking about my books a little later, but Boy, I'd sure recommend people reading my books because I used to teach seminars and I took people who had absolutely no experience, no knowledge, and they became great copywriters who went on to earn fortunes by building a business from the power of their pens. And so the $1,000 to answer your question, I'd go out and I'd become an expert. Actually, I really think that's the best advice that you could give to somebody. I don't really think there's a better answer to that than what you just said. Go out and educate yourself. Figure out what you're doing. You know, this ties in with doing research on the product. you got to have the preparation. you got to have a knowledge and understanding of what it is that you're trying to accomplish because if you don't, you don't have a map. It's like walking around with no earthly idea which direction to go, and when you get the knowledge, it gives you direction. Uh, let me give you a follow-up to this. Let's say you do go out. You do get all the knowledge. You do know what kind of products to buy or launch or sell. So now you've got $1,000. You spent that all on books, but you've become an expert. So now what you do is you find those products. You can take those products to investors. You can raise capital because in direct marketing, what you're going to be telling your investors is, look, it, 
I'm going to test this product. If it doesn't work, all I'm out is $1,000. If it does work, I can make a million. And so basically, you use the power of direct marketing and your knowledge to go out and raise the capital that you need. I mean, that's how I got started. I saw this pocket calculator. Nobody had ever marketed a pocket calculator. I didn't have any money. I went to a group of investors I had. I raised $12,000. And the deal I had with them was that once I doubled their money, they were out. And I had six months to do it. And the story went on. I lost half their money. But I tested, and I found out which mailing lists worked. And it then took off from there. But you become an expert, and people will be attracted to you and want to invest in you. That's what I did with my carpet cleaning business. That's how I started. My marketing career started in the carpet cleaning business, and I was charging every tape, video set, seminar, newsletter that I could get my hands on on marketing on credit cards just to figure out how to do it. And I didn't have any money to go out and spend on advertising or anything, so I used more cost-effective ways of generating business initially, which is one of the first things, which we kind of talked about, was giving things away for free. I started giving away my services for free, followed up with a really great presentation and building referrals, and that's what pretty much turned my whole business around and that's how I started so well it's knowledge you know I look at the people who attend various seminars I was recently at the Dan Kennedy seminar and I gave a talk and you see the enthusiasm and the drive and the passion that the people come there with to learn when I was giving seminars my seminars were two three thousand bucks and they had to travel to some crazy places to find me <laughs> but these people were hungry for knowledge and you just knew that if they made that commitment to spend that kind of money that they were serious about learning and they did and they learned and they learned well and they went out to become quite successful so i know this works if there's anybody out there that think there's an easy way there really isn't yeah you're right there isn't i don't know anyone that's successful in a legitimate business that has not done their homework that is not an avid reader or at least educating themselves through the form of seminars reading newsletters listening to tapes and just getting an education on whatever it is that they are wanting to learn and with marketing there's so much to this whole business of marketing and to me it's the most interesting thing in the world i don't consider a lot of it work i love to read books on marketing it's just such an interesting subject but if i didn't read the hundreds of books and attend all the seminars and listen to the gurus and learn from that, I don't think I ever would have pulled off what I've been able to accomplish with my marketing business. That's great advice, and I highly encourage all the listeners to listen to what you had to say. You rewind it ten times and listen to it because it is so important. Now, how do the various direct marketing channels affect direct marketing principles, meaning how does direct mail differ from print or television or even web commerce? Well, one of the strengths I feel I have is the fact that in my career I have experienced just about every form of direct marketing from TV infomercials to home shopping to spot commercials to you name it and everything from catalogs to print to direct mail to just everything everything that could be direct response oriented I've been involved in or at least have pretty good awareness of when I look at a product I look at it from a perspective that somebody who is just a TV marketer for example would not look at they look at it will it work on TV I look at it and I say, where will it work? How will it work? What do I have to do? And the second step is, when I look at a product or service, the differences between these various mediums are very subtle. They all utilize the same principles. In other words, they utilize the principles of curiosity. They utilize the principles of satisfaction conviction, of involvement, an involvement device. In other words, all the principles apply the same. There are some that are more enhanced than others for a specific medium. I'll give you an example. Let's talk about direct mail versus maybe mail order, which is a, probably a pretty good example. In a mail order ad, you've got a flat page. You've got to do all of your selling. In a mailing, you've got an envelope. You've got a letter. You've got a brochure. You've got a response vehicle, or usually a card or an envelope. And so you get all of these at various elements. Well, what do they correspond to in a mail order ad? Well, the headline is really the envelope. And so if you create enough curiosity for a person to open that envelope, then you've got them to the next step, which is you want them to read the letter. So that brochure should be so enticing that it gets people to read the letter. The coupon should be so enticing that it gets them to read the letter. The letter is critical. The letter is parallel to what the copy is in a print ad. In other words, you can get rid of the brochure, but if you don't have that letter, you're missing the majority of your selling potential. And the other thing about a direct mail letter, the thing that's a little bit different is in a direct mail letter, that letter should be a personal communication from you personally using personal words like me, I, and you so that it actually reads like a very personal letter. And now, I try to write my mail order ads to look like that as well, but the 
point I want to make is the difference between direct mail and mail order is that direct mail is a very personal form of communication that should be written and should be put together as such. Great. Now, talking about web commerce, what do you see as the way to use the elements that you've had success with in all the other areas and applying it to web commerce? Do you have any thoughts on that? I've been studying web commerce. I've done things in web commerce. The principles are all the same. The only thing I haven't done is start a website that becomes a public company that creates a lot of attention and a lot of interest. Do you uh, have that in the works? That is starting to happen. got sucked into doing that. <laughs> That's about the only thing I haven't done, in a sense, in a big way. Right. But the web is a very powerful tool, but the same principles apply. And you see a lot of these web designers, they don't know what they're designing. They're designing it for beauty. They're designing it for effect. But in essence, many of the things that they're designing have the wrong effect. I'll give you a good example. I heard a web designer do a particular website for me, and they came out with the web pages, and they were all in reverse, reverse type. Well, I know from fact and from the books that I've written, actually, that studies show that reverse type is very detrimental to comprehension, and that it causes people to either turn the page or not read or not understand what they're reading. And these are tests that were done very scientifically. It's not based on my opinion. It's based on testing. And so I see that from a structural standpoint as being a mistake. Some of the other things they do by being too obvious or telling too much of a story and not allowing the power of curiosity to take effect. And so I see a lot of these mistakes in direct marketing used in a website. So basically what I'm saying is that if you understand the direct marketing principles and can be successful in any other form of direct marketing, chances are you will be successful on the web. And the web gives you some really neat opportunities because you can disseminate information at practically no cost. You have people coming to you, which is just unusual. And what other direct marketing resource where people come to you simply by the desire or the hobby or the interest that they have, they're coming to you. They're finding your store as if you were local in their area. And so this is a very powerful concept. The problem with web marketing is that you have so much competition that anybody can set up a shop with a few cents and a similar product and underprice everybody else in the market, that it becomes a rat race. And this is evident by some of the people who are in the business who are the biggest people in the business and are losing money. And there are very few people that are making money. And so what you have to do is really be different, and you have to come up with a product or service that nobody else has. You have to apply the direct marketing principles, and it's got to make sense for web commerce. Yes, I agree. So many people right now are falling in love with the technology, but they don't understand the psychology of marketing, and therefore they're not having success, and then they wonder why. Exactly. Yes, great. Now, I don't think you answered what you kind of touched on. What do you feel is Joe Sugarman's greatest strength? Well, I did touch on it. I think my greatest strength really, there are probably two areas that I feel would be strong. One is in my copywriting ability. And that only comes from all the practice I've had. And believe it or not, from teaching my seminar students, by having to formalize the approach, it enlightened me and made me more aware of what to do. And in addition to that, it was the seminars. When I started the seminars, I had 17 psychological triggers. I'm up to actually 30 now. <laughs> and so you see, you learn from that. And people come and I'll have the students in my audience say, well, isn't such and such a psychological trigger? And I said, you know, I think you're right. Let me write that down. Let me study it. And sure enough, they're right. It's a way to learn how to classify things because you learn more from your students than you really teach. So the seminar really helped a lot. So becoming a good copywriter by virtue of a lot of experience, by virtue of the fact that I myself had to live and die by the success of my ads. If they failed, I lost the money. And so that imposes a pretty good discipline on you. And I'd say the second thing that is probably my strength is the fact that I could look at any product and tell you the best way to market it from personal experience from knowing what infomercials are like to home shopping, to know the pitfalls of these areas. You know, some people will look at a product and say, boy, that'd be a perfect infomercial product. Yeah, it would be, but there are some very serious pitfalls that maybe take it out of that realm. And so you've got to know the reasons for it being a potential success and the reasons why you have to be cautious. And those are the two strengths I think I have. I'm not a genius, believe me. I have had many, many failures, and even to this day, I still have failures and I still make mistakes. But the one thing I learned was I learned from these mistakes, most of them, and hopefully I don't have to make the same mistake two or three times to learn. Well, that's how you get better. I mean, I've said this several times before. I believe I've mentioned on my tapes before that successful business people that I know are not people that started out completely with everything in order, meaning all the financing and all the money they could ever need, all the knowledge and the right staff and the right office and the right database. You know, I mean, it's people that started out and 
made a lot of mistakes and never gave up and they just kept at them and they learned from their mistakes and acted differently and they never perceived any of it as failure. They just perceived it as getting closer and closer to reaching their achievement and their goals and they stuck with it. And so the very successful people that you see out there are the accumulation of many mistakes that have taught them a lot of things and they just kept at it. You know, in saying that and then also realizing that maybe there's a third element to my success, and that is that I have a short attention span. Once I master something, I get bored. And so once I mastered direct marketing in terms of print, I got bored and went to TV. <laughs> once I mastered TV, then I'm feeling a little bored, I might go into the Internet. You know, it's just a continuous process. Do you have a favorite? A favorite? Uh, Do you have a favorite where you like to dabble in TV, print, mail order, catalogs? You know, they're all a lot of fun. They all have a different purpose. They all have a different approach. Because I love to write copy, I probably have a propensity to appreciate print more than TV. But I love TV because there's so much you can do with it. And there's so many uses of the principles that you learn in print that could be applied to TV. As a matter of fact, this is a really important point. When the infomercial industry started out, there were a lot of people playing in that realm, and there were many people who had no direct marketing experience and a few that had a lot of direct marketing experience. When the industry shakeout took place, the only people that were left were the ones that had direct marketing experience. And so it, it just shows you that the knowledge and the background and the experience with direct marketing is so vital in that area. Yes. Do you see other forms of advertising and marketing, such as institutional image, having any value at all, or would you always bank everything on direct response and direct marketing? I'd like to think that every ad, regardless of its institutionality or being an institutional ad or a corporate ad or whatever, should have some form of direct response. Because if it's nothing more than collecting names that you can respond to later, if it's nothing more than giving people an opportunity to express either their appreciation for your company or their lack of appreciation for your advertising, do it. Because that's how you learn. That's what you're going to learn from. And that's why I feel that many of these institutional advertising approaches are an absolute joke. You know, one of the better ones that I came across just recently is the U.S. Postal Service. Believe it or not, I think they have a wonderful ad campaign. And a, a direct response ad campaign, and it's for direct marketing, and it's encouraging direct marketing, and it's encouraging the Postal Service. I mean, there's a big corporate advertiser, and they're doing a very strong direct marketing campaign. Yeah, you know, now that you mentioned that, the post office in the last few years has gotten so much better than what they used to be. And you got to imagine, if there's anyone that should be paying attention to focusing on advertising and marketing, especially for the mail, the mail order business, is the post office, considering they make all their money from guys like us. Well, again, I'm not familiar with the inner workings of the post office, but I will say that I'm impressed with what they're doing from a marketing standpoint. <laughs> now, you know, talking about copyright, you said you really enjoy it. Do you have a formula when you write copy? One is I become an expert on that product, without a doubt. Even if I think I'm an expert, I learn more. If somebody presents a product, for example, a digital watch, and I know everything about digital watches, let's say this was back 25 years ago when I used to advertise them, what I would do is I'd go to the factory that produced them. Now, here I knew just about everything about digital watches, but I go back to the factory, I interview the scientists, I interview the people who put it together, and I become an expert. And very often it's through that experience that I got the really hot selling feature that made this product different from everything else. The second thing I do is with all of this information, I just sit down at a computer and I start typing. And I try to weave a story. I try to realize that the person reading the ad is very much like me, very short attention span. And that person's going to get bored. I've got to create interest in them that they will not forget. So that's what I do. I create an ad that just grabs their interest with a very brief headline and a good sub-headline and a great first sentence and an even better second sentence. And I just keep going through the process. Well, you mentioned in your books and stuff that you don't use big words because you don't know any big words. And you have an area in the book, Triggers, where you talk about keep it stupid and simple, I believe. That's what you call it? Right. And there's a lot of people out there that think everything needs to be grammatically correct and they've really got to have an amazing vocabulary. And what you're saying is that's not true at all. No, not true at all. I think the key here is communicate. You've got to be able to communicate. And the other thing that this kind of brings up, I really want to bring out too, is that after I write an ad, I go through a process of editing. I mean, that editing process may take 10 drafts, may take 20 drafts. The first draft I come out with is not necessarily good grammatically. It doesn't have that great of spelling, although with the spell checkers now it's almost automatic. Grammar checkers that help a lot, too. I just work on those ads over and over again. True, some ads just come right out and they feel good and there are very few changes and I run them and, boy, they do terrific. But the typical story of one of my ads is 
I write it, and I'll make corrections. I'll go through three or four versions. And then after I finish it and test it and I'm running it, if it's the type of product that will last for years, I'm working on a new ad to replace the one that's working. I'm looking at tweaking the one that's working to make it even better. Writing the ad is the simple part. It's the editing and the re-editing that's the tough, tough part. I would agree. There's a lot into it. Who influenced you most in your copywriting years? Do you have any books on the subject that you recommend, if any? Where did you really look for, other than just sitting down in front of a typewriter and bleeding right out of your fingers? Uh, where did you get your copywriting knowledge? Well, actually, I just love to write. For example, when the new cars would come out, I'd pick up brochures at the car dealers, and I'd read them, and they wouldn't give me any really good information. They'd talk about rack and pinion steering, but they wouldn't say what rack and pinion steering was. And I still don't know what rack and pinion steering is. I, mean, I just have no idea. And I've heard it a million times. If somebody's going to tell me one of these days, and I'm going to be awfully disappointed. <laughs> We're gonna anyway, get, both me and you are going to get a million faxes now from everyone that's listening to the state that it's going to explain it. Uh, what's funny is that, yeah, I don't know it either, but I don't know what it is either. But anyway... <laughs> So the point was that I had a concept in the back of my mind that a lot of people would really like to read interesting copy that explains something. And I had read a few books, and I really didn't find a good book on copywriting until I came across David Ogilvy. And he had a couple books out there, and he talked about copy and the effect of copy and the concept, using a concept to sell a product. I seem to resonate with his approach, and my biggest thrill was being told that he was on an airplane with one of his associates, and they were going across the airline magazine, and came across my ad, and he said to his associate, he says, now this is a copywriter, and that was probably one of my biggest thrills, is being told that by the person he was talking to. That was my early influence, and then just experience taught me, you would be able to see in my books, the first few ads that I wrote, they were literally amateurish compared to the style and the approach that I use today. And the other thing I do in my advertising and my copywriting is that they're entertaining. Very often people read them strictly for the entertainment. And if you can imagine a commercial selling proposition to be entertaining, well, that's what I try to make my ads do is to provide entertainment and at the same time, of course, sell my product. Yeah, and then people don't even perceive they're probably going to be insult. Well, that's the goal. That's exactly the impression that I really hope I create in a lot of my advertising. Let me put it this way. I read your interview with ABC. And I really got a lot out of that information. You know, next time I hire a carpet cleaner, I know what to do. Yeah, and that exactly. was really valuable. Now, if you would have taken that information, and let's say you had a carpet cleaning product, maybe a really good ad for you would be to have an ad telling people how to find a really good carpet cleaner. And then at the very end say, but, you know, you might have a few little stains, and it would be silly to hire a carpet cleaner. And so you, why don't you buy this stain remover that I sell, and you won't have to get a carpet cleaner every time. Right. See, I did that when pocket calculators came out. People didn't understand what pocket calculators were. They didn't understand how to use them. They didn't understand what a floating decimal point was. And so I came up with a very wordy ad describing all of these benefits and referring to another ad somewhere in this newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, if they were interested in buying one. And I was deluged with orders. People appreciated the service I provided. And that's one of the things you as a direct marketer can do, provide a real service to your customer and in the process sell them something. You just gave me a very good idea, so thank you. <laughs> it was funny because ever since that show has aired, the 2020 show, I've immediately, because of the posting on the ABC website and everything, have come up with some very amazing strategies that not only will work for myself but also for many of my clients that are in that business. And I'm very glad that you mentioned that because it just triggered another thing. Okay, good. Good. Uh, one of the things also that I think trigger a lot in me, and if I had to point to one thing that has kept me sharp, has kept me on top of things, and probably one of the big reasons for my success, and that is, believe it or not, my competition. If it wasn't for my competition, as much as I hate those sons of bitches, I, I probably would not be where I am today. True. It forces you to stay sharp. You don't get lazy when you have someone out there. What I hate the most is my knockoffs, you know, people that flat out plagiarize and copy from me. But I even learn something from them, and it even forces me to have to extol more of the wonderful reasons why I am superior and my particular products and services are better or for a particular situation more useful than what else is being sold. But, yeah, if people didn't have competition, there wouldn't be as good of products. People wouldn't have as much passion in trying to sell them. And so, yeah, there's a very good side to having competition. And the more savvy and sharper your competition are, the more you've got to stay sharp and savvy yourself or they'll crush you. Yeah, I learned very early that if you're very innovative and very creative, you're going to be ahead of the pack, but people are going to copy you. And that's yes. a normal process. 
I could be very innovative, very creative, but I always knew I had to be ahead of my competition and I had to come up with something different and new. My biggest thrill was watching my competition copy my failures, <laughs> thinking I had a success, and they copied my failures, and I saw them go down the tubes with those failures. That is that was a, Yeah, that was a great joy. But typically, <laughs> they copied the successes as well, and it wasn't the successes. It didn't bother me. I mean, in the beginning it did, but after a while, it was just a normal function of being in business. I just tried to come up with something that was totally different, totally ahead of the game. Right. And the bottom line is, is if you just try to stick with one thing forever, then you're just opening yourself up for someone to come along and pull the rug out from under you. And McDonald's saying is you got to create quicker than they can copy. you got to innovate quicker than they can copy. Well, the key is you've got to reinvent yourself. And if you look through history and you look at, for example, entertainment acts like the Beatles, they continually reinvented themselves. If you looked at their history every year, there was a different group there. They either were changing their music or they were changing their dress or their behavior. Picasso is a good example. He went through all these periods. I mean, a really creative, successful individual is someone who constantly is recreating themselves. Yes, so you're right. Well, that brings up a question. You've seen a lot of changes in the marketing environment over your 25 years plus experience in this field. What's worked in the past that's not working now? I mean, is there anything like the decline of print readership, fragmentation of TV viewership, you know, all the dot-coms, driving up media prices, impact of electronic media, etc. What are your thoughts on all the things that are taking place? Well, my theory about that is that everything works in cycles. And if you study the history of direct marketing, and I mean go back to the early 1900s, which I did and actually point to in my book, you will see parallels that almost are identical to the way new marketing concepts are introduced today. And people think they're new marketing concepts. Really, they're just variations of old concepts. But the point is this, that everything is cyclical. So what worked in the 1920s may work today. Or if it worked in the 1920s, it could have worked in the 1940s, it would have worked in the 1960s, and maybe now and then it'll work again. Right. The point is that everything is cyclical. I'll give you a really good example, infomercials. When I got into infomercials, we were practically in a recession, and the media rates were going down. Media rates were going down because media rates are highly volatile, and they're negotiable. And some of these TV stations had extra time available. They lowered the price rather than run public service. They'd rather run an infomercial, even if it was a lower price than they expected. So in the beginning, when I got into infomercials, the media rates were so expensive that I had a cost per order of $3 for a $40, $50 item. That was sensational. But then, as time went on, the economy got better. The economy started to change. It started to improve. Some of these media giants started raising their rates because a lot of the big corporations were buying media time. And so what happened was the media rates went so high that it is very difficult to make money on an infomercial. Now, we were very fortunate. I got out before we reached that point. I had six incredibly successful years, not only with Blue Blockers, but I had other products. But I saw the media rates going high. I saw the big corporations buying media. I saw the success in the economy that was taking place. I saw all the other things that you mentioned happening, and I said to myself, now is the time to get out. I'm going to wait for the next cycle, and I got out. The people that are making money in infomercials now are making it strictly at the back end, and very few are hits. Ty Bo, of course, is a classic example of somebody hitting it very big. Right. But a lot of these mentoring programs, get-rich-quick programs, real estate programs, they all make their money at the back end. They're lucky to make it in the front end. And you know of a few bankruptcies in that area as well. Oh, yeah. The point is that everything's cyclical. And when is this cycle going to turn up again? My guess is when we hit our next major recession. Again, TV time will drop. People will be tired of going to their stores or not want to go to their stores. They'll be home more. They'll be reading more magazines. They'll be watching TV more. And that's when direct marketing will start taking off. Yeah, very good. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you is many of my members and people that hire me and subscribe to my newsletter and listen to my tapes, they tell me that their customers or prospects are different from other people, which I personally never agree with. Could you talk about your experience with just human nature in general and how it applies to all kinds of people in different markets or geographic well, I, locations? Yeah, I think there's a yes and a no to that question. The yes is that, yes, we're all human. and We all respond to basically the same psychological triggers. We all psychologically and emotionally respond in a very similar way. The differences come in the ethnic nature of the customer. I'll give you a good example of this. If I wanted to sell a wallet in the United States, I could have artificial leather, and it could look very much like a wallet, and I could sell it for a very low price, and I could do very well. When I'm in Germany, the Germans have this emotional attachment to pure leather. 
they love pure leather. So if I offered this imitation wallet at a very low price in Germany, it would bomb. In fact, it would probably do worse than one that was pure leather at triple the price. The reason being is that the German emotional attachment is for quality. It's for natural, pure products, pure leather. Another example is I sell my blue blockers on German television, and I get before their audience, and I pitch my product. Well, I don't pitch the cheaper, non-polarized product. I pitch the more expensive product. And so it's very important to me that the product that I present fits into the emotional requirements of that country. Well, now, what is the key here? Well, when I look at my product, I learn everything I can about that product, but I also do something else. I learn everything I can about my customer. And so if they're saying to you, my customer is very unique, well, then you learn about that customer because maybe, maybe this customer has some unique personality or emotional quirk that makes positioning this product different than the way you would position it to the masses or to an audience that's much different than, than the group that you're presenting it to. So really, it's a yes or a no. Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, and I agree with you. And you're right. And I guess start looking at it from traveling across the waters and stuff. And yes, there's definitely going to be differences in what people like and what they dislike. And you obviously are the man with experience on that. Well, a good example is in preparing the hosiery product for sale. I use words that, as a male, I thought were good words. But when you read these to women, they say, well, no, you don't want to use that particular word. Right. And so here's an example of a person saying, yes, our audience is different than you're accustomed to. It's different than the audience that you're used to dealing with. And so, yes, it is true. The audiences are different, and there are emotional differences. It's up to you as the marketer to find what those emotional differences are. And in terms of the thing that I was really referring to, which you just took it to a much broader explanation, is you know I'll have some guy that'll run an ad campaign in Los Angeles, but I'll have a guy in San Diego that'll say, well, you know, it won't work here because people are different in this area. All they care about is price or something like that, which in the context of that, it's just not true. Well, no, some people make statements that are not true. For example, I've had people say, well, sometimes if you raise the price of a product, you'll sell more. And that is so full of baloney that very rarely does that happen. And the circumstances that that happens under are usually special instances where certain things have to be in place, but it's very rare. The truth of the matter is when you lower a price, you sell more of what you're selling. The key is figuring out what you need to sell to maximize your profits. Yeah, an example like that, just changing price alone, is normally not what will cause someone to increase the price and get more sales. There's other elements in terms of the marketing and building the value and everything else that goes into it in order to have experiences like that, because I agree with that. And credibility, too. Sometimes an offer could be so low that it is incredible. Well, then, yeah, you got to recognize that and figure out a way to counter that. And what I've learned, too, and this is a really interesting point, and that is that as you change the price point of your product, the nature of your product changes as well as the approach that needs to be used. A lot of people don't realize that. They say, well, I'm just going to lower the price and it doesn't make any difference. I'll give you an example. We were selling a product called the Pocket CB during the Citizen Band craze. Uh, Citizen Band radios were selling like crazy, and we came out with a little Pocket CB. We started selling those units at thirty-nine ninety-five a piece, and we sold hundreds of thousands of them. And then, as the market started to wane, we had some left over. We ran a special. It was now twenty-nine ninety-five. So it went from a real serious CB product to down to a maybe a hobby. And then to close out our last product, we lowered the price to nineteen ninety-five. Well, the product really became a toy. And so the nature, the concept, the positioning of the product changed as it went down in price. Makes sense. Well, let's do this. We're getting close to time. John, last thing I want to ask you, because I want you to tell the listeners about how they can get copies of your wonderful books and how they can continue the research on what it is that you've learned through your years of experience, and I highly recommend everybody do that. One thing I do want to ask you before you mention that is, how do you differ from other marketing gurus in the business? Because there's a lot of them. Well, that's a good question. I think the difference is that I've actually run the businesses, taken the losses, been the pioneer who's had arrows in my ass, as they say. That's the definition <laughs> of a pioneer. Uh, in other words, I've actually experienced all this firsthand, whereas many of the marketing gurus, and they're very good, they're tremendous resources of information, but they speak from the experiences of other people. And so one of the reasons my seminars were so successful was because they were talking to a practitioner. I did it. I was up there with the best of them. I took the slings and arrows. I failed. I succeeded. And I think people like that. People appreciate that type of input because you can relate to that. Is there a place for both of us? Oh, for sure. Very few people who have been successful and have been operating in the business are willing to share what they know. So there are not too many people like myself left who are even willing to do this. 
but is there a need for a marketing person who hasn't been through all of this experience? Of course there is, because this person has gathered all of this information and has refined it and knows the personal experience, the good information very often from the bad. And so by distilling it and making it available to the public, they provide a wonderful service. So basically the difference is that I've been doing it for years in many different ways, as opposed from an academic standpoint where I just share information. I personally think that you're brilliant. Your books are great. There's so much knowledge that you've recorded down for people to learn from. So how can the listeners get a hold of what you've created and learn more from you? Well, thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate all the compliments. I sometimes question how much of a genius I am when you realize all the failures I've had, and a lot of them I talk about in my books. I've come up with four books that I think all of your listeners should really get. One of them is Advertising Secrets of the Written Word, and that is a step-by-step process of how you can become a great copywriter. And I've given this book to a few people who were friends and were just curious to see what I had written. And after reading it, they said, you know, I never thought I could write a word of copy. I never thought I'd even want to write a word of copy. But after reading your book, I feel I can write copy now. And that's the way my seminar participants left my course. And that's also really important because what people have to realize is if they're in business, they should be able to write their own copy. That is the one thing that I would recommend people study and learn. So anyway, that's the first book. The second book is and it's a 300-page book with a lot of illustrations and also pictures of my ads. The second book is Marketing Secrets of the Mail Order Maverick, and that is mostly with print advertising, and it discusses a lot of my strategy. You know, we talked earlier before about that strategy of involvement in having a spelling computer and having misspelled words. Well, there are a lot of examples of that, and there are a lot of stories. Half the book are stories. The other half are techniques and tips and tools that you need to know. For example, what kind of type to use how to position an ad, how does position affect an ad, how do you get the best media rates, you know, things like that, really practical stuff. And then the third book is on television, and every form of television that I've been in with a lot of stories and a lot of examples and a lot of the principles that apply to TV that that also apply to the other forms of media, but specifically apply to TV. A lot of people don't realize that to get on QVC doesn't cost you anything, but there's a way to do it, and there's a way to get on QVC and maximize your sales. Uh, there are a lot of tips on how to do infomercials and where to go to get them done. And so the book's a very valuable book in that it gives you a perspective for TV. Well, these three books are in a slipcase. I have a total of about a 1,000 pages. The first book is 300, the second book is 400, and the third book is 300 pages. And it's really well written. Well, of course I wrote it. I have to say that. But <laughs> I, I've, I've heard that from a lot of people. Uh, what I'd like to do is offer your group something very, very special, Joe, and that is that if you are interested in all those three books, I will also include Triggers, which is the book on personal selling, which will give you a lot more insights into even direct marketing. I'd like to put in a two-cassette tape on a speech that I gave that talks about many of the topics that I haven't even talked in this tape, and that's a 49.95 value. And you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to throw in a pair of blue blocker sunglasses for everybody who orders. Wow. This package, this complete package, is approximately about, oh, I'd say a couple hundred dollars. I'd like to offer it to your group for ninety nine ninety five, and you get the entire package for ninety nine ninety five. All you have to do is call our toll-free number. We're in West Coast time. We're in Las Vegas. Our toll-free number is 800-323-6400. It's 800-323-6400. You have to say you heard it from Joe Polish's tape because that's the only way we know that you'll be getting this package. And my fax number is 702-597-2000. And if you have any orders, you can also fax it or call our toll-free number. I really do hope everybody gets it. Great. Now, I will say to all the listeners, that is one heck of a deal for 99 bucks. There's a lot there, and including the sunglasses, that's a great deal. So you're crazy if you don't take Joe up on that. I want to say, Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. I think you're brilliant, and I just can only encourage the listeners to follow up on the education. You're one of the masters, one of the best in the world at what you do, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Now, to all my listeners, please let me know what you thought of the interview with Joe. And so with that, continue your marketing education, eat your competition alive, and I'll talk to you next month. Hello, this is Joe Polish. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this interview. I hope you found it very useful. Please give me your feedback on all of the interviews that you listen to. I'd love to hear your feedback so we can always deliver a great program for you. Our website is www.joepolish.com. And we also have a Joe Polish Recommends section, so you can take a lot of the ideas and concepts that you hear on my Genius Network interview series and apply them to your business and find vendors and resources. You can go to joepolish.com to find that information and click on the Joe Polish Recommends section. 
And also, if you would like to find out about more interviews and invest in more useful Genius Network series interviews, go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks, and eat your competition alive.